All right, next up, we have uh, Riley from Airbnb. Cool talk. Hello, hello. Hey, good to see you. Thanks very much for uh, making it. I'm very uh, excited to um, to have you. So uh, we decided to do this as a more as a fireside uh, fireside tap um, uh, format to sort of break the talks and uh, the, the talk format and give a chance for people to interact as well uh, a bit more. So I'll start with a few questions, uh, but um, you know, hopefully, fairly quickly, I'll open it up to you guys. Uh, so. First of all, I'm, uh, I'm curious about your story. So I read somewhere that you actually joined Airbnb at, at the very beginning in 2010. Yeah. Right? Yeah, it was about a year and a half after they'd launched. Um, but it was I was in the first set of 10 employees. Um, it's funny. At the time, it was actually like particularly early stage for a startup to be bringing on you know anyone that would think about data. Um, the term data science hadn't really been coined yet. Uh, it was... You know, two years before Harvard proclaimed that it is the sexiest job of, uh, out there. It was funny because my wife is a ballet dancer, so I give her a lot of shit for that. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was, it was, you know, it, big data has obviously been a rising trend for a long time, but it's something that Airbnb took very seriously very early on, uh, which I think was advantageous for the business. So actually, one of the ways this is interesting is what do you do? You show up in a in a ten person startup. You're the data guy. What, Literally, what, Brian and Joe's bedroom. Okay. <laughs> what what do, you, what do you do for the first six months? Yeah. So so one thing that I've spent a lot of time on at Airbnb and and that my team actually does a lot of in general um, is we create frameworks for the way the company can you know think about how it operates and and those frameworks drive the strategy for the decisions that we make and, and the things that the company does. Um, so my background is economics, and I was um, you know, very excited about a two-sided marketplace. Um, Airbnb is, is very interesting from that you know, perspective. And when I first came in, um, you know, they were thinking a lot about you know, getting hosts in new cities. They didn't have like, a good framework for thinking about how to prioritize cities around the world. Airbnb is kind of, by definition, global. And they could focus on pretty much anywhere and everywhere. You know, the question is, where should they go? You know, New York was kind of our, we started in San Francisco, but New York was absolutely the most dominant market and, and still to this day is. Um, but it was like, okay, well, once we've got New York and San Francisco, you know, do we go to Paris next? Do we go to London? Do we go to Tokyo? You know, what, what's the next place? And uh, so something that I did with them was I, I created... You know, just a, a very basic framework for them to think about growth opportunities. And whereas I think a lot of other, you know, traditional analytics teams would look to exogenous data and say, you know, look at market trends and stuff like that and where do tourists go and, and things along those lines. Um, we've been very user-centric and also data-driven. And so we started with the question, where does our community want to go? And it was as simple as just looking at, like, where are people searching and where is there an imbalance relative to our supply? And, and that gives you, you know, a very clear and sort of immediate goal of, of where we need to go and, and build hosts, like our supply of hosts. Great. And so fast forward, uh, you know, a few years now, uh, what, what, what does data science at Airbnb mean? Where, where is it built? Is it, you know, place recommendation? What, what kind of product are data driven? Yeah, one of, one of the things that I found kind of fascinating about being in, in a startup that's grown so much is that, you know, the structure of the company really mirrors the relationships of the people in kind of the early days. And the fact that I was brought on very early uh, meant that I built relationships with people all around the organization and was involved in basically everything everybody was doing. I mean, it wasn't that hard with, you know, nine other people there. And so in the morning, I would work on, you know, customer support, trying to figure out, like, what people are contacting us about and, and what that means for headcount projections in the future. I do, you know, our financial modeling, you know, trying to forecast the business. Uh, I would do, you know, product analytics, um, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's kind of all the above, and that's that's still the state of the team today. Um, you know, as has been mentioned, you know, a couple times tonight, the, the term data science is very broad, and we've brought people onto the team with very different kind of skills and backgrounds. Um, I, I wouldn't say that it's sort of like a, a one-size-fits-all type of thing, you know, like... We've brought on PhDs, we've brought on people straight out of undergrad, we've brought people in who are really experienced, people with you know, no experience at all. Um, and we've brought people in you know, who are you know, closer to engineers, who are very interested in data infrastructure and you know, the, the productionization of you know, machine learning models. 
And we brought people in who are very interested in, you know, kind of, you know, strategic analysis and like driving operational teams and, and you know, product development and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Any any lessons there, or is that is that you know sort of it takes a bunch of different people to get to build a team, or do you find like certain types of people work out or don't work out, or? Yeah, I I've stopped trying to predict, you know, who's going to work out really well at Airbnb. Um, we've modified our interview process really heavily over the last couple of years, and I think that's something that Jake has really picked up on. Um, in the early days, we would do kind of what most people do, you know, where we'd bring people in and we'd give them a bunch of logic problems and, you know, whiteboard stuff and, you know, try to assess whether they were smart. And it, it, we didn't hire anyone wrong, like we didn't bring on people who were necessarily bad, but I think we just got terrible reads on people. And so ultimately what we decided is, is that it's a lot easier just to see how somebody will do the work that we have to do. And so now it's really straightforward, like people come in. They sit with the team for the day. We give them a computer with access to live data. We ask them a question and give them, you know, eight hours to work on it. And and over the course of the day, we work with them. Uh, we hang out with them over lunch. You know, they get a sense for what it's like to work on the team. We get a sense for what it's like to work with them. And then at the end of the day, they present their findings to us, um, and not to like the whole team, but to like a subset. You know, just a couple of us. And that's where we can go deep on on you know, what they've uncovered, and we can qu pretty quickly pick up on, you know, what their strengths and weaknesses are, right? Because in a very compressed time frame, somebody's naturally going to veer toward the thing that they do best. And so you can kind of figure out how good they are at that and also why they didn't take other approaches to what they uncovered. Um, you also get a sense for some of the other things that people have talked about, like data empathy, which I really like. That's a great term. Um, or, you know, their ability to communicate, which is huge. Um, something that I've been really plugging recently back in San Francisco is that like there's this big disconnect between data scientists and, and not data scientists. You know, for, for us, like 95% of the problem is, you know, finding some sort of actionable, rigorous insight that's going to change the future of the business. Um, and last 5% is the communication layer. You know, it's like you throw into some crappy Excel chart and show someone whatever. Um, but for the recipient, you know, it's, it's the other way around. Like 95% is that communication layer, and you really have to nail that uh, because they just assume that everything that you did was really great. Um, so we've been increasingly focused on people who, you know, are, are very clear communicators who can break a complex problem down into something really intuitive. Um, how, how many people do you have now on the team? 20. 20? Yeah. Okay. Out of where there's 500 people at the Airbnb or 400, something like that? Yeah, there's 400 in San Francisco. There's 400 more globally oh, that, that yeah. um, you know, do customer support and, you know, local operations and stuff like that. Okay. But uh, the core of the product team is in San Francisco. Okay, great. Can you tell us a little bit about the sort of the tools of the trade, uh, both on the sort of data infrastructure part and then on the data science analysis part? Yeah, yeah. So our tools have evolved a lot over the last couple of years. Um, it took forever for us to get a Hadoop cluster up and running and get Hive stable, and it's just a nightmare. Uh, mostly because we had one engineer who had never built a Hadoop cluster, so lesson learned. Get someone who's done it before. Um, but today we're, you know, all of our data is stored in Hadoop. It's all on Amazon AWS. Uh, we've got Hive on top of that, which is using Mesos to kind of manage its memory, which has been really great. Um, we've also started playing with Presto, uh, which is kind of a faster version of Hive. Uh, it does a lot in memory. It can't really ha handle as much data as, as Hive, but when you need something, you know, pretty quick, uh, when you're just kind of like playing with data and trying to get a sense for it, it's, it's been really good. Um, and there was a tool that uh, some of our engineers developed a year ago. They open sourced it called Kronos for scheduling ETL jobs, which has been really useful. Um, and on the sort of, I don't know, data science side? Sure. Sure, yeah. So, so, you know, we do a lot in Hive, obviously. But, um, but once you extract the data from the cluster, you know, we're, we're pretty open-minded about what tools people use. I'd say predominantly it's R and Python. We've got a few economists who really hold out for Stata. Um, and then in terms of visualization, you know, it's kind of whatever people want to do. It's like whatever tool is most relevant. Um, in terms of kind of reporting on data, uh, you know, for real-time stuff, we're using StatsD and Graphite. Um, for just kind of ad hoc, you know, tactical dashboards, we're using the R package in Shiny, um, which is nice because it facilitates data scientists managing the uh, dashboards uh, as opposed to, you know, doing something all in JavaScript, which tends not to be our forte. Where, where are the uh, pain points in your process as of now? So when you talk to different data scientists, you 
sometimes, you know, occasionally hear, well, you know, we spend like 60% of our time just uh, dealing with, uh, you know, uploading the data and then cleaning the data, yeah. the, you know, that part. What's your experience? Yeah, yeah. So, so one of the things that I've been really working on with Airbnb is trying to create a culture of, you know, curation of high-quality data, you know, outside of our team. Um, it's important to get logging right, and it's important for people outside of our team to feel really responsible for that, knowing that the better data that they create, the better insights they're going to get, and the more quickly they're going to happen. Um, you know, there, there are some teams that really have that nailed, and they, tip, they typically are teams that, you know, uh, that are companies that are completely fueled by data. I think Square is a great example of that. Um, and I think we're getting there as an organization, but... Uh, We've developed a logging framework um, that is, you know, an, a, it creates a very clean sort of event log of, of things that have happened historically, which sounds kind of obvious, but we were doing a lot of our analysis off of production tables um, just because, you know, they were there and it was easy. But the problem with production tables is they're a state of the world as it currently stands. It's a source of truth for now, but it's not a source of truth for what's happened historically because a lot of things tend to get overwritten. Um, and so that's been a very painful thing for us to work with in the past, and, and so we we totally changed the way we log data, and uh, we made data scientists responsible for instrumenting everything on the site, uh, which is pretty cool because then they're the experts at you know the taxonomy of our logging systems and how things are implemented and all that, where it's stored. Uh, and then we also made data scientists responsible for uh, the warehouse, the way it's designed. And we're we're just this week finishing a monstrous overhaul of our whole you know data repository. And, uh, and we've done a lot that, that just simplifies everything. It makes it more intuitive, which will not only help data scientists, but it sort of democratizes data throughout the organization. So everybody, uh, with some limits, everybody can have access to the data and run their own, so this is self-serve. Yeah. Uh, and that's, and that's super key, because otherwise data scientists are like the gatekeepers of information, which is incredibly inefficient. And you know, they just get buried in ad hoc requests for you know, stupid little things that people should be able to like, answer on their own. Um, and so we've invested a lot of time over the last six months in, in tools and, you know, a kind of structure of our repository that will make it very, you know, easy for people who are less technical to interact with the data and develop their own insights, which won't be wrong, which is also key. And a little bit to the, you know, pain points uh, thread, was there anything in the, you know, last four years uh, that just didn't work? Uh, you know, we, we lost <laughs> been here. smooth sailing, easy, yeah, all four I'm years, sure every minute of it. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, anything that the audience could learn from and sort of not to do? Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, definitely. Uh, there are lots of things we've learned along the way. I think, you know, going back, um, if I could start my four years over again, um, I would have hired a great data infrastructure engineer, like, immediately. Um, They're worth their weight in gold. Uh, I would have hired an ETL specialist immediately to, you know, help structure the data warehouse in the way that we have it now. Um, I would have you know, structured the interview process like I described because it's, it's very efficient and it, it, it helps us find great data scientists very quickly um, who may not kind of stand out on paper, um, but we, we just push everyone through the process because you know, it, it makes those decisions for us you know, much better than, than we would have otherwise. Um, and then like another kind of interesting learning uh, has been that, that it's, it's very valuable to kind of keep it simple. Um, you know, it's, it's everyone that joins the team that doesn't have a lot of experience tends to want to go straight to like machine learning. And it's like random force, everything. Um, and, and that's, that's great like in some places, but it's, it's not great in others. And in fact, there was one moment in Airbnb history where, you know, I was, I was getting really excited about this framework for kind of the two-sided marketplace and, you know, how sophisticated we could get with it. And it kind of blew up in my face because I made it too complicated. Um, and we had hundreds of people all over the world trying to, you know, interact with this super complex model that was, you know, trying to score all of our listings across all these different features. And they're trying to, like, help host optimize their listings. And, you know, and then they were being measured against, you know, the, the, this, this very convoluted metric that basically only I understood. And, and it, was just, it was just too complicated. Like, you know, it's, it's so valuable to just keep it simple, you know, make your work intuitive, you know, have all the complexity exist on the back end, but at the end of the day, you have to have something that people around the organization really buy into, um, which kind of brought me back to the ability to communicate. Like, that was, that was a very kind of useful moment for me. Very cool. So I promised I would open to questions. Uh, so one over there. Hi, I'm Mario. Um, so you described 
Can you <clears throat> describe the very complex scoring that you had, but what actually happens now if I go on Airbnb and I search for a specific city and specific price? How do you rank all the properties that you have? How does our search algorithm work? Sorry? How does our search algorithm work? Yeah. Is that what you're asking? Um, there's a lot to it these days, um, but you know, it's most basic level. You know, we are obviously trying to return both the best listing for you that we think you'll want to book uh, with the information that we have about you and also kind of subset those listings um, and rank them according to you know, the, the hosts that we think are most likely to accept your reservation. Um, so it's a, it's a two-sided matching algorithm. Um, there's enormous complexity there. This is something we've been working on for years. You know, in, in the very early days, it was just simple heuristics you know, that were scored, like you know, how many pictures you have as a host and how many reviews and stuff like that, and all that bumps you up in search. Um, we wrote a blog post about a year ago uh, on, uh, titled Location Relevance, which was a project where we were trying to kind of dynamically understand and predict where people would want to stay given what they search for for any location in the world. Um, and it turns out that's really complicated. Like when we were, you know, thinking about this, it was like, well, you know, you search for San Francisco and we return listings in San Francisco. And we would pass San Francisco to Google's API and it would come back with some lat long coordinates. And we would, you know, drop the user in the center of the city and, you know, just return listings, you know, kind of spread out from there. The problem with that is in the center of San Francisco is the Tenderloin, which is like the worst neighborhood in the city. And so we were trying to send everybody to the Tenderloin. And it was like, okay, that doesn't make sense. And so then it was like, okay, well, you know, how can we, how can we be a little bit sneakier about this? Um, and we tried like, you know, distant demotion, distance demotion curves where we, you know, kind of like, you know, include listings out to a certain sort of distance from the center of the city and, and, you know, but then you've got like LA and you've got Manhattan and like, these are nothing like each other. And then we tried to pick up on like, okay, well, where do, where do people, you know, when they search in San Francisco, where do they wind up booking, right? You know, that, that's, that's a nice way of kind of leveraging data and, and making this a little bit more sophisticated. Um, then we created these massive gravitational forces towards where everybody books. Um, and, uh, uh, and so then we got a little bit more sophisticated and had sort of uh, uh, some conditional probabilities that were layered over one another. And so it was like, you know, where do you book given where you search and where do you search given where people typically book? And it started to kind of mix things up really well and started to work a lot better. Um, so I don't know, there's, there's lots of examples of things that we've done with the search algorithm that are pretty cool, um, but there's, there's a lot to it these days. Great, so we have actually only time for one more as it turns out, but you're gonna be around after mm -hmm. this, right? Mm -hmm. Hi, uh, Richard Blue, working with an ad agency called Assembly. Um, you, are, you made a very good point that is exactly what I'm trying to tackle at the moment, is how do you empower typical users who are used to working with spreadsheets and the usual kind of office tools? You want to equip them to use the big data and the insights you can find. What have you found works well for that kind of user base? Yeah, uh, well that was you know, largely the inspiration for this warehouse overhaul. You know, because what we've, what we've known on the data science team for a long time is that the kind of methodology for calculating a lot of our most basic metrics is pretty complicated. Um, and so that's something that now all happens in an ETL job and it, you know, dump, dumps out a resulting table that's just very simple. You know, like there's one timestamp, you know, one action, uh, some context for that action, but there's no logic that they have to apply to it. It is, if they want to know how many people booked yesterday, there's just a table of like people who booked and when they booked. Um, so that, that's been good. Tool-wise, we've, we've taught everyone SQL. Um, we think that that's not, you know, too much to ask. Um, and, you know, so it's been fun, you know, training like our comms team and, you know, people in customer support and design, the designers hate it, but, you know, we, we teach them and it's, and, and ultimately they like it because it levels up their game a little bit. And what's useful about that from my perspective is it, it helps make the whole organization data driven because they become more data curious. Um, so one other, one other tool that we built recently, uh, is taking after what they've developed at HiPal, which is a nice interface for, uh, Hive where you can surface queries that have been written by other people against the tables that you're interested in. And you know, so it, it, it teaches people SQL pretty quickly um, and gives us some best practices and also makes it a lot faster for them to iterate on, on what they're doing. Uh, so we found that to be really valuable. Great, thank you very much. All right.